Hello, everybody. My name is Pablo Wojcicki, and I'm a faculty member at Northwestern University and the director of the Center for Latinx Digital Media. Thank you so much for joining us for today's weekly virtual seminar of the Center. This is the very first seminar of our third consecutive year doing this work. It is really a pleasure to have you with us today. The mission of the Center is to create knowledge about digital media in Latinx and Latin American communities across the Americas. Today's speaker is a leading scholar in this space. Christopher Chavez is an associate professor in the School of Journalism and Communication, and also the director of the Center for Latina, Latino, and Latin American Studies at the University of Oregon. Facundo Suenzo, a doctoral student at Northwestern and coordinator of the Center for Latinx Digital Media, will introduce Christopher in just a minute. I am delighted to note that this quarter, our series is co-sponsored by the Alice Kaplan Institute for the Humanities, the Buffett Institute for Global Affairs, the Center for Global Culture and Communication, the Department of Communication Studies, the Department of Radio, Television and Film, and the program in Latin American and Caribbean Studies. But before we go to the seminar, I would like to start by acknowledging that Northwestern is a community of learners situated within a network of historical and contemporary relationships with Native American tribes, communities, parents, students, and alumni. It is also in close proximity to an urban Native American community in Chicago and near several tribes in the Midwest. The Northwestern campus sits on the traditional homelands of the people of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Orawa, as well as the Menominee, Miami, and Hochunk nations. It was also a site of trade, travel, gathering, and healing for more than a dozen other Native tribes, and is still home to over 100,000 tribal members in the state of Illinois. It is within Northwestern's responsibility as an academic institution to disseminate knowledge about Native peoples and institutions' history with them. Consistent with the university's commitment to diversity and inclusion, Northwestern works towards building relationships with Native American communities through academic pursuits, partnerships, historical recognitions, community service, and enrollment efforts. Let me say briefly a little bit more about how the seminar will unfold. First, Facundo, will share more with us about Christopher's research and career in just a couple of minutes. Then Christopher will present his work. And after that, we will open for questions. Please enter your questions in the Q&A function of the webinar at the bottom of the screen at any point in time during the talk. At the end of the talk, we will start getting them and you can continue entering them as we transition into the Q&A. Facundo will moderate them. At the end, we will deliver some closing remarks. Once again, many, many thanks for joining us. And without further ado, Facundo, the screen is all yours. Hi, Pablo. Um, would you mind uh, giving me the, the co-host um, option so I can show my video? I think now, yes. There we go. Thank you very much, uh, Pablo, and hello, everyone. Um, I'm incredibly honored to have been invited uh, to today's opening seminar to introduce uh, Professor Christopher Chavez and to come moderate this very promising presentation at the Center for Latinx Digital Media. Professor Chavez is an associate professor in the School of Journalism and Communication and the director of the Center for Latino and, Latina and Latin American Studies at the University of Oregon in the United States. Christopher Chavez holds a Bachelor of Science in Marketing from the California State Polytechnic University and after that, he received his PhD and a master's in communication and communication management from the Annenberg School for Communication, University of Southern California. Dr. Chavez has authored three books and several book chapters and has written numerous journals articles focusing on globalization, media, and Latinx cultural production. He has published in venues such as the International Journal of Communication, Television and New Media, Communication, and Critical Cultural Studies, among others. His latest book, published in 2021 by the University of Arizona Press, is The Sound of Exclusion, NPR and the Latinx Public, where he examines how national public radio conceptualizes the Latinx listener, arguing that NPR employs a number, a number of industries practices that secure its position as a wide public space while relegating Latinx listeners to the periphery. Professor Chavez has also received many distinctions in the field, just to mention two of them, in 2019, he was awarded the top paper in the Latina Latino Communication Studies Division at the National Communication Association. 
And this year, he obtained the University of Oregon Advice in Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in Research Award. Please join me in welcoming Professor Christopher Chavez. Uh, I think you are, uh, you're muted. Uh, I think you're muted. Excellent. So how about now? So I'll go ahead and share my screen. Uh, first, I wanted to um, thank Pablo for inviting me to this presentation. Uh, thank you, Facundo, for orchestrating this and to the center for really providing this wonderful uh, forum in which to share ideas. Uh, the focus of my research today is going to be on the book project, um, The Sound of Exclusion, NPR in the Latinx Public, which came out in December. Um, and it came out at a moment where NPR was wrapping up its 50th year anniversary, and it was wrapping it up around the banner of Hear Every Voice, which was a, a marketing and branding device for it. Um, and there's a lot of promise in that idea of Hear Every Voice, uh, a sense of inclusivity uh, that it would purport to represent the public and large in its many multifaceted um, ways of being. Um, but it seems like a really good opportunity to really distinguish between this rhetoric of inclusivity uh, that NPR has really marketed and benefited over the course of its 50-year uh, history and the actual broadcast practices that it employs that either impede or promote that mission of inclusivity. Uh, so that's really much the spirit of the book um, as it was written. Um, I began the book with this moment in time. It was uh, March 25th, 2006, uh, when over 500,000 demonstrators gathered in downtown Los Angeles to protest the Sensenbrenner Bill. Uh, it was legislation that was circulating that would criminalize undocumented immigrants as well as those who gave them aid. Um, and it seemed to be this pivot moment uh, where Latinos were finally going to take up the political mantle, engage civically, um, and really kind of retain um, kind of shaping political discourses at the national level. Um, obviously, there's have been some stunning reversals ever since then, but it seemed to be this moment of change, a moment of promise. Uh, and so I wanted to focus on that particular moment. Uh, and I was interested really in different kinds of, of journalistic discourses that were occurring during this moment. Uh, and I provide attention really between two kinds of discourses. NPR, which is America's flagship, um, largest publicly funded radio network, um, really found itself into falling into familiar tropes, uh, positioning Latinos with either according to criminality or according to their economic value, um, not necessarily including the voice of Latinos themselves, but having experts and sources speak for Latinos or on behalf of the Latino community. Um, and I think generally that reflected national medias and mainstream medias um, kind of inability to grasp this moment and to include the actual voices of Latinos who are being profoundly impacted by this legislation. But if you were listening, there was an alternative set of discourses that were happening at the same time that was happening on commercial radio and particularly Spanish language commercial radio. Uh, you had DJs like uh, Umberto uh, Luna, El Mandril, El Cucuy, El Piolín, who were engaging their listeners civically, um, encouraging them to gather in downtown uh, and to protest in a peaceful fashion. Um, and that seemed to be more of a model of civic engagement, um, lateral communication that had been envisioned. Now, it kind of disrupted this dichotomy between public and commercial radio, uh, whereas commercial radio is always seen as being uh, crass or profit-driven, and public radio is being beyond those kind of economic considerations. But this moment in time really disrupted that binary uh, that we come to think about um, in terms of public and, um, and commercial radio. And this is one of those things that I really wanted to interrogate more is, is that line between public and commercial. So, I mean, a couple of questions that really came out of this moment is, you know, here we are, um, 2022, what has NPR really become uh, versus what it was originally meant to be? What was that original mission statement of public radio and what the founders envisioned for it? Uh, what has it become over time? And then how is it changing and pivoting in response to a public uh, that is becoming more racially, ethnically, and linguistically diverse? Uh, we know that by 2050, uh, the U.S. will become basically a post-white country um, where people that are considered ethnic minorities, Blacks, Latinos, and so forth, um, are going to be the majority. And so how are these large media institutions changing uh, in response to that? So focusing on NPR, really exploring that kind of questions. Um, specifically, the theoretical questions that I was looking at is, how does NPR specifically conceptualize the public that it's tasked with serving? Uh, again, as flagship um, countries, this country's flagship radio network, how does it think about that public? 
Uh, second, how are capitalist and racial ideologies embedded within specific broadcast practices? Uh, and then finally, how do Latino practitioners working within the public radio system negotiate and sometimes subvert uh, the constraints imposed by NPR for their own purposes? Um, so those were the three primary driving questions. Um, just a couple of things in terms of setup, why NPR? Uh, again, as I'd mentioned, um, you know, it's the country's largest uh, publicly funded radio network and is a network that purports to represent the nation. NPR asserts unique claims about what it means to be American, but also who gets to be considered American. So there's important symbolic work that the network does. Um, in some cases, many of the findings can cut across other um, disenfranchised groups, uh, but I wanted to focus specifically on the Latinx community for you know, two primary reasons I think makes us distinct. Uh, one is the issue of language. Uh, many of us speak um, multiple languages, Spanish dominant or bilingual. Um, but then there's also this ongoing notion of citizenship where we are never quite considered uh, full members of, of um, being citizens of the United States. So this question of citizenship uh, is something that I wanted to uh, engage further. Uh, the two driving theoretical concepts that I was building on was political economy. So looking at uh, NPR as not only a cultural producer, um, but as a organization that, that needs resources and competes for resources in a competitive marketplace. So looking at the interplay between symbolic and economic dimensions of the production of meaning, um, and then overlapped with that uh, drawing primarily from critical cultural studies, uh, specifically the intersection of capitalist and racial ideologies, um, and then specifically as, as it relates to notions of citizenship and how um, again, NPR conceptualizes the public. So in order to answer some of these questions, um, you know, I looked, approached it in, in a couple of different facets. Uh, first, looking at documents, and specifically different kinds of documents. Um, so I looked at archival material, um, the reports, the commissioned uh, studies that were done, leading up until the point that NPR um, was established, and then the strategic uh, documents that have guided the organization over time. Uh, these would include things from the Carnegie uh, Foundation and the Ford Foundation, uh, as well as governmental records like congressional testimonies every time there's an appropriation um, claim. And then in terms of public discourses, uh, uh, so things like programming, interviews, NPR published book, uh, public service announcement, its own website. Uh, and so to give you a sense of the documents that I had taken a look at, uh, again, the hidden medium, um, all of these had been, um, you know, substantive reports that were commissioned um, in the early days of um, conceptualizing what public radio could be. And then NPR itself has become a prolific cultural producer beyond the content that it that it primarily does as an news organization. It's almost become its own brand um, kind of manager. Uh, so it's produced a significant amount of books on industry practices, on history, on culture, on music. Uh, so it's done a really nice job of branding itself over time. Uh, so I looked at at, um, at some of those discourses. Uh, it's internal communication, so how it trains its own reporters on the NPR style, its ethics standards, its reporting standards. Um, so that became part of the focal point of the research that I did. Uh, and then finally, um, you know, looking at interviews uh, and interviewing some of the cultural producers working within NPR, uh, including some of the original architects of NPR, uh, current people that have um, practitioners that have thriving programs on NPR, um, people that have uh, worked at NPR over time at the local level, but primarily at the national level. Uh, so a lot of the documents were um, supported by some of these uh, interviews. So I guess I'll break it down into uh, the first part of the book, which looks at industry practices, uh, again, that shape NPR's mission of reaching its broader public. Uh, and then the second part of the book pivots and reverses the point of view looking at the role of Latinx cultural producers who have had uh, been able to exploit the system of differences um, to have thriving radio programs on NPR. Um, and again, this is a kind of an evolving project. But um, looking at NPR, and, and again, one of the first questions that I had very early on is, what was NPR originally meant to be? Uh, and then what has it become over time? Uh, so NPR is really an extension of an ongoing project that started really at the onset of radio. Uh, the very first iteration of it was 1925, the Association of College and University Broadcasting Stations um, formed basically an educational network that became the precursor of NPR, which NPR was eventually grafted upon. And many of the people that were involved, um, at least very early on, were very suspicious of the role of commercial radio. 
uh, the idea that because it was driven by economic interest, that it was never truly going to serve um, any kind of forum for public discourse or civic engagement or even meeting the needs of the people that were most in disenfranchised um, by commercial radio uh, because of commercial radio's economic mandate. Um, Jürgen Habermas and his notion of public sphere had always been skeptical of economic, um, um, of um, commercially funded radio. Uh, once you insert the economic mandate that you really can't have a pure or true public discussion. Uh, but promotes of public radio offer that, you know, in some ways the, the, the broadband format of radio um, could provide a more democratic notion of Habermas's public sphere. Uh, what we've seen over time that that has existed in various forms, generally marked by an ethos of noblesse oblige, um, you know, promoting classical radio or art, uh, high art in politics. Uh, so that had generally been the hallmark of uh, at least early educational radio. Around the 1970s, there was really a call for um, an increasing call for public radio uh, and a public radio system that would uh, uh, exist as an alternative to commercial radio. Um, and these were going to be um, meant to serve the most disenfranchised listener, uh, the rural, the uh, homebound, people that were not necessarily um, citizen consumers. Um, and in the years before NPR was established, let next listeners were really not specifically identified um, specifically, partially because the concept of a unified construct that we call Latinx or Latina Latino uh, didn't exist during this time in, in, um, in the years prior to the, the network's founding. But second, demographically, um, we weren't a significant force. And so you do see in some of those early reports mention of um, what will eventually become the Latinx community, but um, you know, almost in some sort of paternalistic ways um, in reports, the disadvantaged, the elderly, the chronically ill, the poor, the migrants, the retarded, the ethnic and racial minorities. Uh, these were the people that were intended to be um, at least served by a system that would become NPR. Uh, in other cases, the Spanish-speaking illiterates of Florida. And so these were definitely um, iterations of what how it could serve the Latinx community. Formally, the network was established through the Pro Public Broadcasting Act of 1967, um, and it was really set up as, as um, a corporation for public broadcasting, which oversaw two arms, PBS, which would oversee its television arm, an NPR that would oversee the radio uh, network of it. And in some ways, um, the radio component to it, the, the part that ended up uh, establishing NPR was really a, an afterthought. Uh, the legislation was really meant to promote television uh, as its primary. And, and there's some sort of uh, discussion that at the very last minute, the idea of having a public radio network was, was taped on, literally taped on um, very late in the process. Um, and so, um, the idea was that it was going to have a tiered organizational structure where you would have a national overlay, um, which could provide some of, of the content, but really much of the content was going to be driven at the local level uh, in places like Southern California or Texas, these small rural communities uh, throughout the country. That's where most of the content would come from. In reality, in an execution, it's, it's become almost reversed, where much of the content today uh, is driven at the national level and less and less um, of the content is driven at the local level, uh, depending even on what market you're thinking of. Um, but it started off modestly. It had 88 stations representing non-commercial and community radio stations across the country. And again, grafted onto an existing uh, construct of educational radio. But one thing becomes clear in those, those early documents of what public radio was meant to be. First, it was meant to serve a broader, more inclusive definition of the public, um, not just those who were already civically engaged or affluent um, that were overserved in the commercial marketplace, but people that were distinctly disenfranchised that could use civic discourse or could and should be engaged in civic discourses. And then the second part of that is the civic nature of that kind of discourse, that it wasn't going to be a top-down kind of communication, but it would be a horizontal flow of communication that would start to prompt conversation amongst listeners, between listeners and their civic institutions, between the radio station and the listener. Uh, and so it was meant to provide a dialogue and it was meant very, very specifically to get listeners actively engaged in their community. Uh, and when you read that original statement that Bill Seemering wrote in 1970, it's, it's a beautiful statement. It's very lofty and it's very inclusive. Uh, and it, he's very clear about uh, NPR speaking in many voices and in many dialects and respecting difference, uh, not the sameness of, of um, you know, many kinds of audiences and audience constructions. 
Uh, and so Bill Sermi had written, again, this very beautiful, inclusive statement. And, and I had a chance to interview Bill Simmering as part of this project, uh, again, to get his sense of, of the network and where it has gone. So um, again, this was very early on what they had hoped NPR would be. But almost immediately, it becomes not that. Uh, it moves in a very di different direction and largely driven by its economic and practical needs. So almost immediately, it becomes apparent that uh, NPR is not serving its listeners of color. Uh, and within the first several years of its life, uh, people start to raise red flags about NPR's overserving of primarily educated, affluent white audiences and underserving uh, audiences of color uh, that had been disenfranchised. Uh, and so the Carnegie Com Commission's a blue ribbon panel, uh, which identifies media's um, NPR's lack of diversity of a problem. Uh, and then a very specific and pointed report called a formula for change. Um, produced by the Task Force Minorities in Public Broadcasting really raise a ton of issues about the structure of NPR and, and public radio and public uh, media in general, um, including lack of minority ownership, uh, lack of minorities in, in key positions, uh, lack of investment in uh, Latinx and um, Black specific programming. Uh, and so there's been huge deficits that were, um, that were identified as early as 1977. Uh, and in response to this, for a short moment of time, uh, NPR establishes the Department of Specialized Audiences, uh, which was meant to invest in programming that would serve these audiences. It was, it was meant to be somewhat uh, of a response to the critiques of this report. Uh, that was short-lived. Uh, and it was short-lived because of the financial pressures that NPR had received um, almost immediately. Um, and so because they weren't reaching the audiences that they wanted to in the amounts of, of uh, in, in the amount that they wanted to, uh, they started to bring in uh, practices that were becoming popular in marketing and advertising. Uh, and so they brought in researchers from uh, audience research analysis to really think about the public, not necessarily as a public, but as an audience that could then uh, subsidize the network in particular ways. Uh, and so I found this quote from David Giovannini, um, a, net, a researcher for ARA that worked, um, you know, very closely with NPR. Um, but I think it says it all, you know, it's programming is a lot like bait. What we catch depends on what we set out. Honey draws bees, worms lower fish, and a hunk of liver will bring strained cats to your door. In the same way, certain kinds of listeners are attracted to certain kinds of programming. So when we choose what we air, we select who will listen and also who won't. Uh, and in some cases, this sets up the audience that they're going to talk to. Um, and so over the course of, you know, the 80s and the 1990s, uh, they set up a template which really drives NPR's mission to this day or how they conceptualize the audience. Um, and so they went about, uh, again, studying the current listener and who that listener was. And they also borrowed from, uh, again, marketing practices. And one of the things that had been um, really kind of, of um, implemented was the use of market segmentation or, or audience segmentation. And what that is, is a practice by which you take uh, the population at large in all its diverse forms, uh, and then you segment it according to assumed similarities. Uh, so you slice off of that pie, and then you say, okay, we're not going to serve everybody, but we are going to overserve one particular audience that we don't identify as being unique to um, uh, and important for us as an organization. Um, so there's multiple steps that I found in this process. Uh, the first was justify the need to target um, and at this point, the rhetoric of NPR changes from being exclusive for everybody, for the most disenfranchised, um, to that, that notion being impractical, um, almost saying that, you know what, that's pretty naive for us to think about that way. What we really have to do uh, is to segment an audience that we think is going to be very, very important to us and then overserve that audience. So um, that's the first step that they wanted to do was to um, really shift the conversation about reaching a broader audience and reaching a more targeted audience. The second part of that, well, who is that audience is going to be? If it's not going to be everybody, you have to identify who that audience is going to be. Um, and they identified people who had money, uh, that were already engaged, uh, that were engaged in their communities, uh, what they called actualizers and fulfills. Um, and so using the values and uh, lifestyle segments, uh, which marketers were using at that time, uh, they identified a listener that was already civic engaged and had the resources that could then subsidize um, NPR. And then second, once you've done this, then take a colorblind approach, uh, what they called a strategy of transcendence. And they really kind of flipped the rhetoric on this uh, in terms of talking about serving um, you know, Latinx listeners as being segmented and as being not for everybody and actually 
uh, in opposition to, um, to, to something broader and more inclusive. What they were going to do is take a colorblind approach where they're actually going to talk to people that were, again, highly educated, highly informed, and really not think about color um, and not think about language and not thinking about ethnicity and how they uh, approached it. So this, in turn, again, shapes the audience and how they think about it to this day. And they've never really kind of deviated from this template. Uh, we see how it shapes specific kinds of practices. Uh, so all of a sudden, um, around this time, you start to be, see specific moves being made from specialized programming uh, or the use of distinct voices um, to having a, a more of a, of a um, again, a colorblind space. So one of the areas that I was interested in was looking at uh, sound. You know, there's something unique about radio that makes it different from uh, television or in film, uh, where difference can be seen phonetically or through our features. Uh, here, it's very audio driven. So looking at specifically at the voice. Um, and in this section, really looking at NPR's move again around this time uh, to walk away from Spanish language programming, uh, which had been, you know, experimenting in some markets uh, throughout this time. Uh, and there was a, a show that had received some popularity called Enfoque Nacional, um, which had, had been, you know, a training ground for Latinx journalists uh, that were addressing issues that were important to Latinos, uh, and they axed it because they didn't think it was uh, important to their mission. Uh, but it was interesting in how, or the rationale that they gave for eliminating funding for Foca Nacional. Uh, one of them was that um, the argument that we can't serve Spanish-speaking Latinos because we don't, it was sort of a circular argument because we don't have any Spanish language content. Um, and so it was a circular argument once they walked away from it. But the second, I think for me, the more intriguing part of it was um, basically positioning themselves as just another property in the media marketplace. Uh, up until that time, NPR as a public radio station had a unique mission because it wasn't commercial radio. Uh, but the argument that Latinos could be served by um, commercial radio was a, at least a new argument for NPR. Uh, abdicating its role to have, um, you know, again, something that was publicly funded. As I mentioned, there was something unique about, um, about radio uh, in that you hear the voice. And this is um, an issue or, um, you know, a theme that has been going on again since the onset of radio. Uh, when the BBC was established, for example, um, the decision to elevate one way of speaking as the broadcast standard uh, became a very, very real issue. And so with the BBC, what they did was basically elevate British received pronunciation as the preferred language, because the idea was that their public radio system um, was gonna elevate the masses uh, and had a commission that would then police language and discipline language so that uh, you would coordinate one way of speaking as the standard, as the norm. When NPR was established, um, it was established with very different kinds of principles. So is it meant to be sort of um, reifying class distinctions, at least um, in rhetoric, but it was meant to be more uh, democratic, uh, meant to represent the nation at, at large. Um, but that never really kind of, again, took place. So what we found is that NPR has cultivated an idealized dialect that is really intended to mimic spontaneous conversation, but which is, in fact, highly scripted. Um, so it's really generally devoid of regional and ethnic accent, what sociolinguists refer to as standard American English. Um, which in turn sh uh, shuts out uh, speakers of what we think of as stigmatized varieties. So we don't hear a proliferation of Black voices or Latinx voices, um, voices with, um, you know, really distinct ethnic and regional kinds of accents. Uh, Milroy, uh, Leslie Milroy talks about this when she talks about the idea of uh, linguistic standardization in broadcast and um, basically, basically that it serves as um, almost in the same space as whiteness. Um, where it's what's left behind. It's a negative designation. It's what left behind when you don't have um, speakers of stigmatized varieties. But if you are a speaker uh, that speaks with an accent or speaks um, in a way that marks you ethnically and regionally, um, NPR may not be a, a comfortable place for you. And, and this, uh, at least some of the um, participants that I spoke to uh, really had uh, an issue with it about talking about the experience of modulating their voices so they could fit the NPR Stanford. Um, Chenjirai Kumanika uh, wrote about this in Transom, and I had an opportunity to interview him uh, about really kind of thinking about the NPR voice and its standard, and then really trying to coerce his voice in a way that would fit much more, um, you know, congruently uh, with, the, with the NPR standard. Um, so specifically, the way that NPR polices voice is one through informal mechanisms, 
um, by the time that people are hired in NPR, they've already been inculcated into a system in which they speak in ways that are going to be congruent with that workplace. I see it with my journalism students that I work with over here at the SOJC, where their voices will change. The way that they speak for broadcast purposes is different than the way that they speak in everyday lives. But they're trying to achieve a congruency between the newsroom that they want to work with uh, and their own voice. Uh, and so this involves a lot of self-correction, disciplining your own voice again so that you can have uh, more airtime. And then finally, we found that uh, listeners uh, provided much of the feedback, uh, really not being shy about um, if, if somebody spoke in an accent uh, or referenced a place or a name in accented English. Uh, a lot of listeners were not simply happy about it, and they would let the network know about it. Uh, but then in addition to this, you have formal mechanisms, things like style guide, voice coaches that go in and work with speakers uh, to pronounce things in certain ways, editors and producers, uh, and then finally time limitations, which I'll talk about um, with this, you know, with all things considered. Um, in speaking with some of the practitioners, it seems like two real significant changes have impacted this. Uh, one is the segment of, or the, the length of any kind of any given segment um, in, in specifically the programs. So something like All Things Considered when it was originally launched was you could have a, a segment for about 20 minutes. And when you listen to the very first episode of All Things Considered, it's amazing for the one of the amount of time that it goes on for, um, but also the range of voices that you hear, um, Black voices, uh, working class voices, voices from Philly, voices from DC, voices from New York, voices that have really distinct regional accents. Uh, what has happened over time is that th those segments have been shortened. And so now the idea of having a 20 minute segment on a particular piece is unthinkable. And so when you have shorter segments, you rely on testimonies then that then can become uh, really quick and really polished. And so they now have over relied, not necessarily on um, the people that are impacted by news, but sources, uh, professors, by politicians, by administrators, by bureaucrats. Uh, people that be, tend to be disproportionately white, upper class, uh, and educated. Um, so one of the folks that I had a, to interview, a chance to interview was A. Martinez, who's now uh, host at Morning Edition um, at NPR's flagship um, uh, radio network. Um, and so I spoke to him in a moment when he was actually in Los Angeles um, in Take Two, uh, which is a local program at the time there. Um, and his uh, transition to NPR was rough. Uh, so when he was first hired to work at NPR, um, LA Weekly really uh, wrote a scathing uh, review of him, um, that it was basically affirmative action for uh, NPR's local station, um, KPCC. Um, and he talked about, again, this idea of struggling with his voice. What makes A. Martinez really interesting to me, at least, is that he didn't, he wasn't groomed in the public radio system uh, in the way that many of the other um, uh, key talent have been. He came from sports radio. Uh, he was reporting on the Dodgers, and then he uh, spent time on take two uh, at the local level. And at that point, he was already talking about having to chorus his voice, uh, because in commercial radio, and particularly sports radio, uh, you have a more of a motive way of speaking. Uh, but at NPR, it, much, it was much more subdued, uh, much more accentless. Um, and so he, he really spoke about some of the, the moments in really trying to uh, modulate in voice in this way and, and who was involved in that. Uh, since then, and since the book was published, he is now at, um, again, uh, looking at Morning Edition at the national level. So his voice has even become uh, more standardized um, in a way that it wasn't before. So it's interesting to see the progression of his voice uh, over this time. And he was he was very gracious uh, in the insight that he gave um, during our interview. Uh, so here he is today, really becoming the public face. Uh, the second part of this, uh, and I'll you know work through this pretty expeditiously, was uh, looking at the, the reverse angle of it. So looking at cultural production from Latinos um, who had um, found a space in NPR, who were able to subvert some of these um, broadcasting standards and guidelines, uh, exploit changes in technology in the marketplace um, to have thriving programs, which is a small miracle. Uh, and so the three case studies that I looked at were Latino USA, Radio Ambulante, and a Latino. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to have um, opportunities to interview basically the founders and producers of all three of these programs. And so uh, we'll start with, um, I guess, some of the overarching themes of um, each of the three case studies. Uh, each one reflects the economic, demographic, and technological disruptions that have occurred um, over any given point in time. 
Uh, I found in each of these cases, the practitioners have been able to exploit these disruptions, the public radio system to their advantage. That said, they differ in how they imagine their ideal listeners uh, and the way in which they use language to reach their intended audiences. Um, I did find in each case that each of these producers has some level of cultural, social, or professional capital. Uh, and they're also just very smart marketers, right? Even though it's the public um, radio system, uh, they're very, very smart and savvy about thinking about their, their uh, programs as brands in a competitive media marketplace. And so they've been able to navigate that uh, in a way that other folks haven't. Um, so just really quickly in terms of Latino USA, um, you know, even though it's right now currently associated with Mariano Hossa, uh, it's an original form, it was a collaboration between educators, between um, philanthropists, and between um, broadcast producers um, at the university level. So it was based out of the University of Texas, um, and it was meant to kind of capitalize on the terrestrial system that the University of Texas had had at that time. Um, originally, they were trying to figure out what it was going to be. Was it going to be specifically Chicano-centric? Uh, and they opted more for Latino, uh, a more inclusive, pan-ethnic version um, or orientation. Um, but for close to 10 years, it rolled along as a university-affiliated ra radio station. Um, Mariana Jose took control of that um, you know, in 2010. And since then, it has really become a successful brand. Uh, Mariana Jose has, has proven to be just a shrewd businesswoman uh, who thinks about the program as a brand and has been very successful about navigating that brand in the marketplace. Um, so, and I, again, a lot of one of the, the challenges of writing about media is that every time that you kind of put something in print, something will change or some sort of evolution happen. And I think two kind of changes uh, that occurred subsequently to writing this book are, are noteworthy. Um, first is that, uh, you know, congratulations to Latino USA or Futuro, Futuro Media. Uh, they won a Pulitzer last year uh, for their work on a podcast called Suave. Uh, and so, again, shows you kind of how influential that they've become over time. I think the second significant change is that they left NPR as their distributor, their primary distributor, uh, to move towards PRX, which was a competitor. Uh, and in interviews, Marina Hosa has said that NPR never really supported the show in the way that she thought that they should. Um, and so that left her to seek opportunities elsewhere. And so we'll again go uh, just briefly into that a little bit later. If um, if Latino you say was a slow build uh, that took you know all close to thirty years to get to this point of prominence, Radio Ambiente was almost out the start a success, uh, and partially given the the technological disruptions that had happened at the time. So to give you a sense of of what has happened in almost ten years. Um, you know, in 2012, it was just an idea, uh, and you had, it, it's the, the product of, of a husband and wife team, Daniel Alarcon and his wife, Carolina Guerrera, and um, they basically have this idea that they had um, about creating a podcast, uh, and they started a Kickstarter campaign. Um, they, you know, raised close to $60,000 in funding through that Kickstarter campaign, uh, and they began creating podcasts. Neither of them are radio people, so they weren't groomed in any kind Kind of radio programming. So part of this is just a process of, of learning, trying to figure it out, uh, which they do. Um, but by the next year, next year, they enter into a partnership short-lived with uh, Public Radio International, producing work on their behalf. And then three years later, they enter into a significant partnership with NPR, which they currently have. Uh, 2021, uh, Alarcon wins the MacArthur Genius Award. But at this time, and again, a relatively short amount of time, given the, the disruption, the digital disruption that happened, uh, they've been really to take this property uh, from ground to full-blown success in a relatively short amount of time, which is something that was probably inconceivable, um, you know, 20 years ago. Uh, part of it, you know, they think about their audiences differently. If Latino USA thinks of their audiences primarily as a national audience, uh, Radio Ambilante thinks about it as a hemispheric audience. And so they have uh, basically, when you look at their newsroom and sort of their newsroom discussions, they're bringing in journalists from all over the world, from Bogota, from uh, Lima, from Mexico City, from Los Angeles, uh, from New York is where they're based. And so uh, they've really done a fantastic job of bringing in and using these digital platforms in order to develop stories, to edit these stories, um, all through the use of digital technologies. And then finally, Alt Latino, uh, which is, is a little bit different. If the first two focus more on, on news and sort of in-depth storytelling, Alt Latino is, is a music-oriented program uh, originally started by Felix Contreras and Jasmine um, Garst. 
And they really use music as a platform in which to, in some ways, promote counter hegemonic discourses. Um, so again, a, a typical show will focus on a singer. Um, it tends to have cosmopolitan sensibilities in that they're bringing in singers from um, all over the world. It might be Ana Puelo from uh, the Dominican Republic uh, or from um, uh, Mala from Spain or from Haco City or Latinx artists here in the United States. Uh, but they're really bringing in a diverse set of voices. But they also are using music uh, as a platform to critique uh, politics. And so this was evident in one of their shows called Protesting Trump's Immigration Policy Through Song, uh, in which they used basically the genre of music reporting uh, to talk about how artists were wrestling with this issue that was really important for the country um, without laying claim to it. And in some ways, they're able to have conversations that NPR wouldn't allow in its flagship news programs like All Things Considered or Morning Edition, uh, things that are considered um, protected by what they call like their editorial firewall, right? That they aren't supposed to show any kind of, of um, objectivity in their reporting. Um, but because it's the music genre that um, they've, been, they've been able to have much more pointed discussions and more pointed critiques of the administration uh, precisely because it is a radio program on music. So key takeaways with all, all of this, um, and then I'll wrap it up, is um, you know NPR has over time become a media dr company driven by marketplace logic. Uh, if you were to basically, you know, go on to any, um, you know, NPR schedule um, at an NPR member station, you might find a mix of NPR produced content, like All Things Considered, maybe some local content, but you'd also find, you know, The Daily, uh, an NYT, uh, New York Times property, uh, or the New Yorker Radio Hour, uh, both commercial radio. Uh, and so nowadays, commercial radio products exist side by side uh, with publicly produced radio products. Um, that NPR has over time cultivated a passive rather than active uh, listening experience. Uh, again, this was not the original intention of NPR, uh, that it continues to target audiences with significant economic, cultural, and social capital. These are people that are already being overserved in the media marketplace with media content. Uh, so that means that it is not serving uh, the most disenfranchised listener that was envisioned very early on, people that are in most need of civic discourses. Um, so that means their articulation of the Latinx listener is one that is completely congruent with that listener. Uh, so somebody, again, that is already overserved, uh, but not somebody that is necessarily uh, isolated linguistically or associationally or even geographically, uh, that doesn't seem to be the audience that they're uh, particularly interested in. Um, and so, again, they've failed some of these audiences that were seen really early on as being key to uh, the mission statement of NPR. Uh, and then again, as I mentioned, the distinction between public and commercial radio has, has really been disappeared. You can really see evidence of marketplace uh, logic uh, in the way that NPR has operated and how it uh, conducts its business. So with that, um, I'll, I guess I'll end with the postscript. So right when the book came out in December of, of uh, last year, uh, there had been a set of high profile um, departures, right? They had already started. Uh, again, I mentioned Mariani Josa left NPR and uh, moved with PRX, uh, but you also saw Lulu Garcia Navarro leaving, uh, Audie Cornish leaving for CNN, uh, Sam, Sam, Sam Sanders, it's been a minute, left NPR. So all of these were people of color that had left around the same time. Uh, and so NPR was wrestling again with this issue of, are we serving uh, listeners of color? Are we serving journalists of color? Uh, and it seems to just be this perpetual cycle that NPR goes through where they wrestle with it, there becomes sort of a public reckoning with it, but they never really address it, at least in any kind of meaningful way. Uh, whether they will this time around has yet to be seen, but it seems like this conversation keeps happening historically. It happened in 1977 um, you know, uh, with the Task Force for Minorities and Change report. It happened with the axing of Enfoque Nacional. Uh, it happens with every time there's a, a removal of a product that's meant to serve uh, Latinx audiences, um, this conversation will come up. Again, we'll, whether this round of, uh, of departures uh, will prompt any sort of long-term meaningful reflection uh, remains to be seen. But I think what we do know about organizations generally is that they tend to be conservative. Uh, and so they will make changes that will maybe address the short-term problem, uh, but not necessarily address it in the long-term. So um, with that, I'll open it up for questions. 
Thank you, uh, Professor Chavez, for uh, this fantastic presentation. Um, I would like to start with two questions, but first I would like to uh, remind, the, remind the audience that uh, they can uh, enter the questions into the Q&A uh, button that is in the, in the bottom of the screen. So feel free to, um, to reach your questions there and I will happily um, communicate to, to Christopher. Um, so my, my first question is uh, about uh, the role of the state and how do you think that um, your study and your case reflects in some way uh, the evolution of this, like the idea of state and nation state in US and how do you see this parallelism in between like the, the NPR and the conception of, of the medium, but also uh, in parallel with the evolution of the state of the national state in the US. Um, and my second question, I, I found it very interesting how, in one of the, um, the latest cases that you, you mentioned about how um, these Latinx production, culture and practices are sort of erasing the borders in, and, by, and by that including journalists from other parts of, uh, not only from the US. So I was wondering um, if this might have, and if you uh, saw some evidence of this impacting the business of NPR in terms of the driving audience from outside of the US um, uh, to, to NPR. That's, that's my, that's our, my two questions. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, to address the first one, I, I definitely think that the way that NPR conceptualizes its audience's relationship to uh, is directly related to kind of how the state thinks about its public. Um, so this idea of where Latinos belong in the American imaginary has always been sort of secondary. We're never quite citizens or almost citizens, uh, despite our you know residential tenure in the United States or our long-standing uh, presence in parts that were once other other countries, but were now uh, significant parts of the of the U.S. And so Latinos have never really been included as part of that public imaginary. And I think the way that NPR conceptualizes public is some way reflective of that, um, and some way reflects some of that. Um, and I think right now we're starting to see, again, sort of reversion to the idea of uh, nationalism uh, and the idea of what it means to be American and a pro-American value uh, is already, it seems to be also kind of amping up some of, some of that discourse about who gets to be included, who is American. Uh, and I think you're seeing kind of an important um, kind of debate play out right now. Uh, but again, this seems to be happening ongoing, right? It never seems to fully resolve itself. Um, I guess the second one in terms of, of bringing in other kinds of influence. I certainly think that NPR is, is aware of sort of the, the global nature of its brand at this point. Um, and in some ways at the member station level, you start to see bringing in properties for like example, the BBC uh, or Canadian broadcasting system. So the ringing in properties from other countries, uh, they tend to be very similar to the US. So they're not bringing in, for example, uh, at least at a lot of NPR member stations content from, um, you know, stations produced in, in Africa or Latin America or the global South. Uh, these are the UK, Canada, and North America. And so they are bringing in content that has similar terms of linguistic and cultural proximity, uh, as Straubhauer would say. And so I think that's um, that's one of the things that they're starting to conceptualize again as their brand is being, uh, I guess, more of a, a global orientation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, Valerie has a question. Yeah. Thank you so much for such a wonderful presentation, Professor Chavez. I have two quick questions for you. Um, first, given the response of media to increase diversity, and specifically in the case of Latinx audiences, what do you see as larger implications for the impact of efforts to modulate voice and even going beyond just the general notions of representation with other types of media? And second, I was very interested in what you just presented about using music as a platform to critique politics. And in the case of artists taking the role of influencers in this respect, did you see similar patterns of horizontal communication flow of getting dialogue started and the, really the larger community more engaged with these topics as a result? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for both questions. In terms of uh, voice, yeah, and I think there is an effort to, to at least create spaces for um, more Latinos in, in public broadcasting. And so I think there's always been kind of a goodwill effort to do that. Um, either a couple of things that had impeded part of it was just the limited number of opportunities that were available in public radio. Uh, that has since changed because a number of other kinds of properties, and particularly the rise of broadcasting, has created a ton of new opportunities for uh, cultural producers from different kinds of backgrounds. 
I do st still think that NPR compared to other media organizations is very conservative in its use of voice. So they have been able to find diversity without really finding diversity, at least linguistic diversity. Um, because yeah, you can hire somebody that's uh, Latinx, but allowing them to speak in their own voices or to shape stories from their unique sensibilities doesn't seem to be something that they're um, they're willing to do. Again, that may change over the course of the year. You see some examples of them maybe playing around with that, but for the most part, their Latinx um, you know journalists and hosts uh, speak in accented accentless ways. Um, so I don't see evidence that that they're you know they they seem to be conservative versus other media organizations. Uh, so you hope that they'll they'll play around with that. Um, and then I do think like uh, music has has been a space to kind of subvert some of these conversations. And one of the things that I noticed, and, and in some ways it's related to the first part of the question, is that um, you know NPR. And again, I don't want to simplify it. Is is a really complex organization that has players at the national level. Uh, at the regional level, at the member station level, and they're also working with producers that are independent, who hire their own journalists. And so this experience that the consumer thinks of as NPR is really kind of a multifaceted set of players. Um, and so in some cases, you do see uh, more people of color, but th that could change by property or segment or the kind of show that you're talking about. So NPR's flagship radio programs, like All Things Considered, uh, morning edition is very conservative. Um, so again, they're, they're striving for diversity, but diversity without diversity. Um, you might find more linguistic flexibility in some of the uh, ethnic programs, right? Like uh, Latino or like Code Mix, where you have voices that you, you allow people to speak in their voices, addressing topics that might be of importance to uh, African Americans or Latinos. And so um, those it seems to be concentrated in some spaces and allowed in some spaces, but others are, are more highly policed, it seems. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Val. Um, I think Mora has a question. Yes, I do. Thank you so much, Faguna. And thank you so much, Professor Chavez, for this really insightful presentation. Um, I have a question, which is that I was reminded uh, by a previous seminar that we had with Professor Maria Elena Cepeda about Locatora podcast. And I'm thinking of the role of podcasts in order to give a voice and give a space of representation for different groups uh, in the US, but also, of course, across and over the US, beyond the US. So I'm thinking, up to what point would you say that the story that you told us is a story that can apply to different kinds of traditional media in opposition to social media, or let's call them new media? Because mm -hmm. I clearly see different traditional media being unable or unwilling to give voice to different groups. Whereas I see social media as creating many, many spaces, you know, uh, from the bottom up uh, yeah. that give actually voices to to different groups in the US and beyond. So that, that's my question. Up to what point do you think that this is a story that goes beyond uh, NPR? Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for bringing up that issue, because I think we're, it, you're, we're living in an important moment where podcasting has really created new kinds of opportunities. And that's impacted the field of public radio in, in a couple of different ways. Uh, when it, it creates more competition, which is, which I think is a, a good thing for public radio, because then they're going to have to respond. Uh, because if you have podcasters that are creating new kinds of stories, feature people that speaking in their own kind of voices, um, that's a good thing, right? You have more media diversity uh, versus something that's less pluralistic. Um, and it also creates um, job opportunities for public radio practitioners, because you have more content that's produced in the NPR voice. In some ways, they're out NPRing NPR, right? They're doing it better. They're doing it more sensitively and more inclusively. Uh, so you do have more product out there. I think where it does fall into some of the existing hierarchies is that not all podcasts are the same in that they don't have the same reach. They're not going to be supported in the same kind of way. So when you think of podcasting right now, it still remains primarily a, a white public space. Uh, the number one podcast is Joe Rogan's The Experience, um, promoted on Spotify. Uh, and there's, you know, million dollars of, of marketing that go up behind ensuring that subscribers will listen to that podcast. So, yeah, everybody can have a podcast or there's a potential for it. But the idea that any given podcast will find success in the marketplace is a completely it kind of it's a different set of dynamics. Um, so in NPR's case, they they seem to have been willing to support some, but not all. And I think that was Mariana Jose's frustration with NPR is that they had it. They had a good product, just NPR wasn't willing to market and distribute it in the way that they had hoped. 
Thank you. Uh, we have uh, one question, two questions actually from the audience. Uh, the first one probably partly already addressed uh, by uh, your answer to Mora, but Andrea Otania says, I'm wondering if you can address the work of scholars like Monica de la Torre, who look at grassroots radio, particularly in rural areas. What is the relationship between those stations, either in terms of Latinx hegemonic voices and or pipelines for radio personalities to this national stage? Also, is podcasting Greece in access or is that a fallacy? That's the second yeah. question. And, th and thank you for bringing that up. And I think one of the things that I wanted to make sure with this work was that um, I didn't undermine sort of the really good work that's being done at the local level and the community level. Um, and so early on this project, I was encouraged by um, uh, by a station manager, for example, to think about, he's like, well, think about your project differently. Uh, talk about um, Radio Bilingue, right, which does some amazing work uh, in, you know, mostly amongst um, rural Latinos. Uh, it's done in multilingual, uh, and there's some really interesting kinds of stories. So there's some important work that's being done at the community level. Um, I think I was engaging Hector Maya's uh, argument that, um, yes, these are important spaces for us to have, but it's also important to be um, involved and engaged in the majoritarian public sphere, which NPR is. Like, um, I think just the sheer scale and the influence that NPR has uh, warrants discussion, right? Warrants um, at least an assertion that we belong in those kinds of spaces uh, and that we take control of it. In some ways, a, a big part of this project was reclaiming national public radio as our space. Uh, so yeah, we do we do have these other kinds of spaces in public media uh, that are doing really good work, but the focus of this project was really trying to reclaim that that national public space, the majoritarian public sphere. And, and there's another question very similar to this, but maybe you have also some words to add to. Um, Andy asked about the role of universities, Latinx community in bringing uh, topics that are important to us. What, uh, if you have some thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, I mean, I guess I'm, I'm of two minds. I, I think there's a lot of really good scholarship and I, I think this, this forum is a really good um, um, evidence of that, uh, that are happening amongst uh, Latino scholars, both at the undergraduate, the graduate level, and the faculty level that that uh, need a forum for these kind of conversations to happen. And now we have platforms that allow us to do that. Uh, again, whether they will have access to, um, you know, something like NPR or public radio systems, I think we're, we're starting to see more movement in that way. Uh, at the same time, you know, we, again, in many ways are are, we benefit from the system, right? We, we tend to be civically engaged. We tend to be able to at least operate to varying degrees in, in the dominant language, English. Uh, we're not the disenfranchised listener that, that many of the, uh, again, what public radio should be serving. And so in some ways, we are the ideal Latinx uh, NPR listener uh, because again, we, we are culturally engaged, we're overserved civically, in some ways economically. Uh, and so we, we are already benefiting from the system. Uh, so I guess that's kind of the, ambivalent way that I feel about it. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Um, we have our last question uh, from Fatima. Hi, Chris. Thank you so much for the talk. Um, I'm just curious about how the Latinx NPR programming coexists with the other programming because there seems to be a mainstream NPR programming in this, the, um, the other ones that might be, you know, a representation of the diverse audiences, but not in conversation with the mainstream ones. Yeah, they, they seem to be one-offs and almost um, kind of segmented or even ghettoized, right? And so it's not, again, not meant to kind of infiltrate the protected properties, which again would be all things considered, morning edition. Uh, those are almost kind of sacred cows. And then you have these other diversity programs that you can get, you know, either through a digital platform, but it's not meant to disrupt um, the, the dominant listener. One of the conversations that I would have with station managers and programming directors was that, their, their audience, the audience that tends to give to their stations are older, they tend to be white, and they tend to be English monolingual, and they also don't like to hear other languages uh, or other kinds of stories. And so uh, programming directors were very aware not to include anything that might disrupt the, um, the listening experience for what they call the legacy audience. Uh, and it was a palpable fear, uh, the idea that if you lose that, that listener, even for a short amount of time by having uh, translated English or um, words, testimonies, and actualities in their own language, that that would be disruptive. And it wasn't something that they were necessarily willing to do. Uh, so they offer it, uh, but they tend to be, you know, on digital platforms or think something that you can get uh, in a segregated space so that you're not disrupting at least the terrestrial experience. Yeah, 
Uh, and that where there might be kind of a distinction between the terrestrial experience, what you hear when you're driving down the road, listening to the radio, uh, and then the digital experience, which could be much more personalized. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, for a fabulous seminar. Thanks, uh, everybody in the audience, for great questions. Uh, special message of congratulations to Diana Leon Boyce in the audience for having her first book published uh, very recently. We all look forward to reading it, Diana. And um, I want to thank Facundo for great moderation. Again, Chris, uh, thanks so much for a fabulous way to kick off the third uh, year of the seminar series. And I invite everybody to join us next week for Judith Mariscal's uh, talk from CIDE in Mexico City. And in the meantime, have a great rest of your days and weekend. Bye now. <laughs>